The views and opinions of this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. Well, there's been plenty of talk the last several days of this potential heat that we could see across a wide area of the U.S. this week. Are we going to put our crops underneath a dome of doom, as some people like to call it? Or are we going to see enough rain to help us through a hot stretch here through the back half of July? Let's talk about it. Joining us now, Eric Stongrass with Nutrient Ag Solutions for our weekly weather update. Eric, good to talk with you again this week. And I know... Before we really dive into the heat potential, we've seen a fair amount of rain over the last several days, severe weather. I know I saw some monster supercells Sunday out in the Dakotas, for instance. I mean, talk about what we've been seeing here when it comes to rain and severe weather as of late. Yeah, I mean, even this morning coming out of uh, North and South Dakota and Minnesota was a squall line, but the really well-defined bow echo, and I'm waiting, you know, it's kind of early in the morning, you're still waiting to see what the damage reports look like from that. It's pretty nasty. And unfortunately, I think we're going to see more of that as this, uh, you know, this this upper level ridge, you know, starts in the southeast, is in the mid south now, is going to move, you know, through the Mississippi Valley and go toward the southern plains, and all along the edges of that is where we get the most, you know, s- severe storms and heavy rain. Now, this past weekend dumped rain through the Corn Belt. I mean, so much of the Corn Belt grabbed, you know, in some places uh, two, three tenths, some places two to three, four, five, six inches of rain. I mean, I just got a text message from a guy that's down in um, south- southeastern Illinois. He's like, hey, I'm now 11 inches above the average on the year. And uh, he's down in southeastern Illinois. And this has been the, the way it's been. We've started to fill in some of the holes that were pretty prevalent, uh, some in Kansas, some in Illinois, Indiana, uh, some of the Dakotas. And so now the attention is going to turn to, you know, all right, we got all this water. Uh, what's the heat doing? So what's interesting, Jesse, before we start that part of the conversation is you go back over the last 45 days. And if you start in eastern Iowa, go through Illinois, Indiana, include Kentucky, Tennessee, but get through the eastern Corn Belt, it's been very, very warm overnight. It's the top five. And in, in, in the case of Ohio, it's the warmest uh, overnight low temperatures they've seen. Now, that's not come from... Um, you know, that's come from consistent warm nights, not like just a few that are like 85 or something ridiculous. And we know that that can be a stressor on the crop. And we made up all of the deficits we had from the loss of GDDs early back in May and early June. I just, and I've heard some people talk about this. I don't understand it. So this is just, I'm commenting on what people have told me, but the rapid growth of the corn crop, especially has resulted in the tassel still being kind of wrapped in uh, leaf, you know, like, mm-hmm. and it didn't come out and it's had some pollination issues because of it. And that's not everywhere. It's just a few places. Um, and so I've, I've probably talked to just as many farmers that, oh yeah, I've seen that as some are going like, I haven't seen any of that, but we're curious that these warm overnight lows have had an impact on, um, you know, the reproductive stages of that crop. And then we got questions. How long does the heat last? Cause it is going to be smoking hot in the midsection of the country today. We got heat advisories heat watches, excessive heat warnings out all the way up through the, you know, the central U.S., the, the Ohio Valley, the Mid-South, and temperatures are going to crank, and it's humid, so it can be gross. <laughs> um, so it's just, uh, you know, when that crop's uncomfortable, we're, we're uncomfortable, the crop's uncomfortable, right? So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that, that's where we are as we work our way into the third week of July. Well, let's talk a little bit about this heat, and I believe last week you and I talked about this intense cape that's over parts yeah. of the, uh, you know, Iowa, Illinois, etc. All that added humidity. Some folks like to refer to it as corn sweat, you know, things like that. And then you just yeah. look at all of this heat out there this week. And I mentioned it at the top that dome of doom is sometimes the uh, term that some folks like to use. But I, I think the big question is. How long does this last here as we go through the rest of July, Eric? Well, you can get into a position in July and August where the pattern gets very stagnant. You're at the peak of summer heating, and the jet stream is way far to the north. And as a result, there's not a whole lot of reason to move things around unless you have a tropical event that takes place or something big that happens in the Atlantic or Pacific that just repositions a front. And so if you don't see that... And what ends up happening is the ridge builds into the lower Mississippi River Valley. And then a week later, it's moved to western Kansas, right? Just slides ever so slightly to the west. So we could get ourselves into a situation where the southern plains get stuck in this ridge. And what that means is the domes of the heat dome all around its edge is where the storms are going to be. And that puts most of the Corn Belt 
from the Canadian Prairie to the Northern Plains, the Midwest into the Mid-Atlantic, that whole corridor under the gun for a lot of, you know, severe weather. So here's the answer to your question. Okay. You need to think about humidity from two perspectives. One is specific humidity. The other is relative humidity. So the specific humidity is actual measurement of how much moisture is in the air. But it's, you can look at it relative, though, to the temperature. That's what, what's relative and relative humidity. So listen, down in Oklahoma and Texas, the specific humidity is going to be high, but the temperature is going to be really high. And the difference between the amount of water vapor the atmosphere can hold versus what it is holding is huge. So therefore, you it's dry, even though the humidity specifically is high the relative humidity is low does that make sense it's kind of a weird thing now come up to iowa it's not quite as hot but therefore you bring the temperature closer to that dew point which is another way of measuring specific humidity oh now you've got a much you got the juice but you've got the relative term much higher boom storms will explode in that and they're going to have plenty of instability the, 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 the heat and humidity in the atmosphere gives way to that instability. And that's why I'm very concerned that running over the edge of that ridge for the next two weeks, it'll be a daily event of going, where did the squall line evolve late in the day? How did it traverse overnight? Where does it end up the next morning? And we could be looking more at pale west, severe winds east. I, I think that's going to be the case with this upcoming pattern. So uh, yeah, it's going to be very wet along the periphery, very hot and dry if you're in the ridge, um, which I think is going to be Mid-South first, lower Mississippi Valley, Mid-South, and then, then then West. So can it survive to August, though, is the big question. Well, and I was going to ask you about August. I, I believe some new longer-range models have just been released when looking into August. What, what are we seeing with those here initially, Eric? Yeah, I think it's going to be a story that's told largely in the tropics. So here's the two scenarios that are getting painted right now. The Climate Prediction Center on Friday suggested that the Mid-South and Southeast is going to be a favorable spot for heat and, hum uh, excuse me, yeah, heat and humidity, but not the storms. So the storms are going to be more in the upper Midwest, Great Lakes, not necessarily in the where you are or even where I am. Now, I'm talking about August, not now, but August. Um, if you use all the models, they take all of that and they shove it west over to Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas. And the competition, I think, is happening with our understanding of what's going on way over in the West Pacific as we start to see, um, you know, the MJO make a move. Now, all of that's just technical babble for we're trying to understand where the atmosphere is going to be breathing, rising motion versus sinking. And um, if you kind of take the MJO at its, uh, you know, core value and just say, look, if it does this, stays you know, initially in the Pacific Ocean, that's now where we've got the ridge runners. But if it relocates to the Indian Ocean, that puts the heat dome back over the Mid-South. If it comes back to the Pacific Ocean, well, it shoves it back west again. And the models are giving you both scenarios. So you're saying, well, what's right? I'm like, I don't know. I, I can, I can <laughs> speculate all day long. <laughs> but the reality is I need to get through the next two weeks before I see that August pattern fully evolve. I'm just going to tell you that I, what I don't expect is I don't expect there to be a shutdown of the Gulf of Mexico. I don't expect there to be uh, a, a problem with um, getting moisture. It's just where will it be distributed? And if you want me to tell you the wise thing to ask is what has the atmosphere already shown us it can do in July? And that is storm along that northern periphery. You'd have to give me a lot of overwhelming evidence to break away from persistence in midsummer uh, than anything else. So I'm going to tell you all, the third scenario is take what we're about to see over the next few weeks and just wash, rinse, repeat. And I think that might be the smarter path going into the month of August. Now, one last thing to think about, Jesse, is the hurricane season. We mm -hmm. keep ratcheting down the risk. There's a lot of Saharan dust. The vertical instability in the tropical Atlantic is low and the pressure is high. Those are all three things that work against developing tropical systems. I think we may be pushing, now this is very speculative, but I think we may be pushing the risk on that hurricane activity fully into September, not necessarily in August. But remember, August is the ramp up. So that'll be important to watch because one big system in the Gulf that chugs moisture clear up to your backyard could be a major difference maker for a lot of folks so i'm going to watch it carefully 
Well, I know folks can stay up to date with the weather uh, very easily, your forecasts and more, agweather.com, ag-wx.com. Eric Stongrass, Nutrient Ag Solutions, always good to talk with you, my friend. Have a great week. We'll talk to you next week. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Jesse. Make sure to subscribe to the Market Talk YouTube channel. You can watch our latest interviews with top market analysts in the country, find bonus content, and much more. It's easy. Just go to youtube.com slash at Market Talk Egg and hit the subscribe button. Or you can search for Market Talk Egg on YouTube.